in depth. Just start right. Five seconds. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have to Dr. Hartson? Or? No, I want to do it. You do it? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> regrets tonight. Oh, don't worry. No, it's a big crowd. Starting with the overview of the proposed yeah. budget. Okay, so I'm Carol Stein, the Assistant Superintendent of Business. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm just going to go through this through this, through, yeah, through this through very quickly and not waste, you know, to spend a whole lot of your time because, you know, um, we, we appreciate the support, though, in, in letting us. Uh, Give this presentation. Absolutely, we're happy to have you guys. Okay, so um, obviously our, our vision, we, we have to start with a vision statement when we do our budget, and so this first slide talks to our vision, and I won't read all of it because it's, it's all here for you, but basically we're looking to continue to maintain strong academics and strong physical health and, and good facilities for our students. We work with our strategic objectives, and these are the six strategic objectives that we work with all year and basically everything we do, so this also guides our budget. Uh, it's a full process. We start back in, uh, really in December with working with the administration and we go all the way through presentations to the community and the board until the board actually adopts the <coughs> budget on April 23rd. And at that point, um, we then work for, do all of the um, reports that we have to do. We have lots of required reporting. All of that is out in our schools now and on our website. And then finally, the culmination of it is the vote on May 21st. So that's really the, the process. So to balance the budget, you know, we talk about the different things, the strategic objectives, the fiscal sustainability. Uh, we look for efficiencies. We can't do everything in one year, so sometimes we'll postpone certain considerations. Um, and then this year, we're also talking about a capital bond, which the presentation we gave almost a month ago, I think. And so some of those things are now in our bond presentation. Uh, this is a slide we just put in to show all the different areas that the school district has to uh, encounter and, and cover. So when you actually look at the detail uh, sheets that we put, put on our website and we give the actual numbers for every item, it's in all of these different categories. And so some people like to know what exactly those categories are. And each one of these has a specific function code that we then work with. And then that's on the, that was on the business side. This is on the curriculum side. So there's lots and lots of layers of things that we have to, to, to account for in schools. So this is a key slide because without doing anything new in our, in our budget, we would still have variances from the prior year. So if we just did everything the same, we would have variances in salaries. Sometimes we have an increase or a decrease in the amount of students who participate in OCED. ed uh, we, we provide related services for students in the John Cardinal O'Connor School and as with the district location. We also do bill those districts back so we get a revenue, but it's still something that increases our budget. We have students that have out-of-district uh, placements for special education, and that number varies every much uh, every year, and it really depends on each student. Um, equipment needs are something we budget every year, um, straight zero budgeting there. We look at what we need. We don't just say, okay, we had this much money last year, and we'll give the same amount of money this year. In fact, this year we kind of cut a lot of it. Uh, in BOCES, we, we use utilize services, and for anyone who's not sure what BOCES is, it's the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, and it's a group that allows school districts to do things that they maybe wouldn't be able to do on their own because they're too costly. And then we look at our benefits, and this year we were fortunate. We had a, a slight decrease in the, um, actually we kind of a large decrease in the teacher's retirement system rate, but we did have health insurance increases, a little bit more than we had in the prior years. Um, and then there's always other contractual benefits. So if we did nothing different, we would have about $1.1 $1 .1 million more in our in a cost than the prior year. We, I actually should have probably started with a revenue slide because then that kind of puts it all together. But the next slide talks about the things that we were able to add with this year's revenue additions. And we are putting in a new phone system. We absolutely have to. We're using um, technology from that actually is using Windows 2000 technology. And if that were to go down, we could not repair it. So that's a year, a lease. Um, we're going to be looking to do a lease because we don't have, you know, several hundred thousand dollars to put a whole new phone system in. Um, we're increasing our security, which is our security guards. We're going to be looking to do some more afternoons and evenings events. Um, right now, we kind of close as soon as school's closed. Um, the board has um, earmarked some money for HR enhancements based on some of the survey and studies we've been doing this year. And our transportation costs have really risen. 
Um, at the same time, our state aid has gone down in transportation, so we're going to be looking to do some sort of studies there to see if there's any more efficiencies we can we can um, squeak out of that process. As you know, we're part of a consortium in Ardsley where we have Ardsley, Hastings, Dobbs Ferry, and Irvington work together to do our busing. So out of district students, special ed students are all riding the same bus that go to these different schools. But we're still hoping that we can find some sort of um, efficiencies. From on the curriculum instruction side, and, and this may be more directly affecting students, we're earmarking some um, some funds for social work programs and social emotional learning. And I do apologize because we use a lot of acronyms in schools, but our board seems to know what SEL means and these kinds of things. So, but uh, programs that we can earmark to, we, we do a lot already, but more things that we can help to, you know, when you look at safety, you want to look at safety from a, a facility point of view, but you also need to look at it from a student and prevention point of view. Um, Amplify Science has been uh, a new program this year, and it's helping us to coordinate with the new science standards that are out from, your, from SED, and this would pay for some more materials and to increase the curriculum there to, to make us compliant with that. Uh, technology devices we're investing in also, and it's more Chromebooks for, so each classrooms have buckets of Chromebooks that they can use and share, so we'd be increasing the amount of, of those devices, and we'd be piloting in the middle school a one-to-one -one device um, program. So it would uh, basically allow each middle schooler to have one Chromebook that would be then assigned to them for probably the rest of their years in Irvington. And it does save us money in the long run because a lot of textbooks now are online and you don't need to actually buy the physical textbook. And when there's a changes to it, you don't need to change your whole set of textbooks. You can do, do download them all to a Chromebook. Uh, lessons plans are divine with that. It doesn't mean that a student is going to be on device all the time. It certainly doesn't mean that because they're not. In fact, it might help us help us because we can now say we have a right now we have a bring what, bring your own device to, um, kind of method, and that will allow us to take some of those cell phones and say no, nope, they've got to go away now. You can't use that device. You have to use this Chromebook. So it's it's going to probably help us in in a lot of ways in that regard. Science research. We have an outstanding program in Irvington. You're going to actually see that we um, are acknowledging some of the science research winners tomorrow night in our board meeting. And uh, we are looking to supplement the program with some extra supplies and a stipend for the, the advisors who are doing that uh, kind of right now, which is a very minimal amount. We have an opportunity this year to um, add 0.6 FTE to our music program, and that's going to be for strings. Um, with Alan Goldberg's retirement, we're going to be able to add and re reorganize how we do our strings department. So this will be kind of a cool uh, thing for us. And if you recall, we've cut program, we've cut music and arts and other programs over the years, and we've restored, slowly restored a lot of them. This is really one of the last things we need to restore in order to get back to where we have been. The community was very um, supportive of having an elementary world language program. And we would ideally would have liked to have two so that we could have done it K through five. So that the budget will allow us to do at least one position this year. And we'll start with grades three through five. And then hopefully in the following year adds grade grades K through two. And this would be a program where these students um, have like a once a week program in Spanish and French and learning the language and just getting excited about the cultural uh, world of, of different languages. And then finally, that there's always a cost of benefits for positions. So our new considerations a total about a little under $500,000. So where we are now is a total budget of um, almost $63 million. Um, it's an increase of 2.62 and a, a tax levy increase of 3.21. However, the tax rate increase is only 0 0.07. And that's because our assessed value actually went up about 3.16 or 17% this year. So the, it kind of corresponded so the tax rate increase was lower than it has been. Um, so, but again, it's a conservative budget. If we have a lot of specialist students that move into the district, we're a little bit at risk there. Tax certs are always a risk. I mean, I think you feel the same thing here. Um, we have quite a few still on the books that we need, we'll, we'll need to pay refunds, and we do maintain a reserve, but it's not that, that large. And we never do know with facility needs what could happen. <coughs> I'll give the example in our capital project presentation. If, if our boiler were to go before we were able to get it done with a capital project, that's $600,000 I would need to find in that year in order to get that boiler fixed, which I don't have at the moment. So that could, could put other things at risk. So this is always a, you know, a tough balancing game. Um, and as I said before, it's aligning with our strategic plans. We're allowing for some more security. We're continuing to invest in our facilities. We're increasing our technology access. Um, this budget has um, always looking to maintain or improve our student learning experiences. 
it supports all of our students. I mean, not just, you know, it, we have such a spectrum of students in Irvington and it supports everyone. We have a, a decent amount in there for ongoing professional development, which is always a need to make, take our teachers um, to be as best they can in the classroom and support a social and emotional support for students. And it is fully compliant with the tax cap. I always give this slide in all of our presentations so the public knows how we calculate it. It's never an easy number to, to look at, but it's basically your prior year times a growth factor times the CPI, which is 1.02, but you take out your exemptions, which are previously um, uh, previously voted on capital capital debt, and then you add back that in, the, the, the number for the following year. So it's kind of a bit of a wash. So our levy increase is $1.7 million. And then other revenue this year is, is uh, a little bit down, so our net revenue is only going to be $1.6 million. State aid is down, even though that you will read everything in the paper that tell you how much New York State gave us all in state aid, but it's not true for us because they lowered our uh, ratios for transportation aid, and some of our other aid is variable based on spending and <coughs> other variable factors. So we, we may have got like $15,000 more in foundation aid. Woo. <laughs> And tuitions are based on actual students that come to Irvington from other districts, either parent place, which, which would be a pa parent paying for it, or another school district paying for, this, for the child for a special ed program. Sales tax, we're anticipating it going up a little bit with um, the, the rising economy and hopefully with the new law that's going to be going on in Westchester. We do reap some benefit there. And the increase in others, mostly our investment income. We are participating in an investment cooperative and seen, have seen some really good rates there. So um, we're right now at investing much higher than uh, some of the some of the other uh, districts that we have. So revenue is up 1.6, and it's the same number, 2.6 percent. Uh, just a quick talk about foundation aid. You know, everybody again says how much what we, we've been getting. This is an interesting slide because if the formula were to run like it's supposed to run, and give foundation aid when it was first created, we would have had about 9.7 million dollars more over the last 10 years. So we've, we've lost out on that because they've really been taking money from Irvington and other school districts here in Westchester and giving it to the city and upstate where the need is supposedly greater and this is their whole equity um, issue. I won't even comment that the Westchester area and Long Island produces a lot of the income that goes to New York State, but I won't even go there. But anyway, we've lost some money there. Um, so this is a slide that just gives you the uh, budget expenditures by the various categories, salaries, benefits, facilities. So we, we look at it a couple of different ways. The board, our board likes to look at uh, the budget in different ways, as, as does our community. And then this slide gives uh, basically the same thing, but it, tell, it shows you pictorially that salaries and benefits are about 72% of our budget. And that makes sense. We are a people business. We have teachers. We have staff. We have custodians. Um, administrators, so that's really what we do. We we're teaching students, so it doesn't surprise us that that's our budget. Uh, f this is a little bit more on a function basis, which is the general support categories that I talked about before, all the business office and personnel and, and uh, finance and things like that, superintendent's office, board, board, uh, board of ed. And then you go into the operations and then the instruction, special education. Instructional support would be like your guidance, your social workers, your pupil services, nursing, things like that. And then transportation benefits and debt service. This is what we, we, we usually put this up so that people can estimate their taxes. We used to do this before, now it's a little bit easier because your assessed value is 100% assessed value, so it does slide made it a lot easier <laughs> than previous where you had to kind of explain that you had to take your equalization rate, but we don't do that anymore. So. And I, I will say that this is based on our assessment role in March. It, it, it could still change by the time we get to August. So I always say it's estimated. Over the years, we've been fairly conservative. Uh, where This is a 2.62, which is a little bit lower growth than last year, but a little bit higher growth than the prior two years. Contingent budget is something that we do, uh, we are concerned about always in, in a school district. If we have a no vote, we ha we're allowed to have one more vote. And then after that, um, we would go to a contingent vote. And a contingent budget basically means you cannot levy more than the prior year. So when you saw that $1.7 million, we would have to take that out of the budget. And if you recall, our revenue was actually down 200 and something thousand. So we would be basically uh, having to cut $1.9 million from our, our, our current budget, which would be a, a really difficult thing for us to do. 
Um, we, it also there's also certain rules. You can't put, buy any equipment. You can't um, use community use of buildings without charging money for that, which a lot of our organizations don't pay us right now. They using it for um, nominal or only custodial costs sometimes, and uh, it would totally cut into our um, student programs and affect staffing. So uh, we do always make sure of, of pointing this out so that the community comes out and knows what that, what they're voting on here. We've had lots of different forums and, and um, presentations. I will say that every presentation we do is put on our website under the budget. Um, if you go to our school district board of ed under, under budget or the business office budget, both places will lead you here. And every presentation we make is on here. There's detail by um, every uh, function code and line so you can get all the detail you want for those people that really enjoy looking at all of the numbers. And, um, and there's also, if you have any questions, you can always um, e email your questions to budget at irvingtonschools.org and we post uh, frequently asked questions where we answer those questions and then continually to add, that, add to that document. So it, this is it, the budget vote is at Main Street School on May 21st and we do encourage everybody to come out and vote. If there's any care. questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> Go let you off easy. Okay. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate right. the, uh, the time. Thank One you. more place for you guys to uh, present the. I'll book. leave some copies for you. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on to announcements. The first is a check over $25,000, which is uh, for the purchase of sewer equipment for a sewer jetting machine out of capital budget for $84,000. Um, next up, uh, Memorial Day ceremonies and parade will be Monday, May 27, 2019, which just happens to be Memorial Day, at uh, 10.45 a.m., um, starting at the Main Street <coughs> Memorials, as always. Um, additionally, the celebration of the Urban Girls Basketball Championship team, uh, which was originally scheduled for yesterday, uh, is now uh, postponed until Sunday, June 2nd, 2019 at 4 p.m. And we will get back to you with the finalized location. Any other announcements from the board? Otherwise, I'll move on to correspondence. Uh, first one is from uh, Gaylord Holmes. Uh, subject, new firehouse and new DPD, DPW facility. Um, there have been significant advances in sustainable technologies in recent years. Certainly when the time comes to build new facilities in Irvington, we need to know what they are and what the facilities are. These sustainable technologies might also make sense for existing village facilities. Next week, How Green Is My Town is presenting the New York Sustainable Energy Conference in Tarrytown. Details are at an Eventbrite um, site. Uh, I hope the representatives of Irvington's government attend this presentation. Sustainability is more important than ever. Sincerely, Gabe or Next up is a letter from Sarah Cox. I don't know if you wanted to talk about it rather than me read it, or I can say yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's always better. If, if you're here, you might as well okay. put more okay. feeling good. into it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, good evening, everybody. Should I quickly read the letter? Please. I'll do that. Okay. This was written by a committee that's been established in Irvington a couple of years ago, recognizing enslaved Africans in Irvington. Dear Mayor Smith and Village Board of Trustees, we should Larry. just say historically slave, not currently. Yeah, just exactly. Just make sure that that's oh, I had some flyers made up, and Christy and I were really laughing about that. There's some back room at Jordan's, but no. Yes, that's but not it is scary case. how there is still modern day slavery, so we want to make sure that we know that this is historic. Yes. <laughs> As you may know, a group of Irvingtonians, including members of the Irvington Activists, Irvington Historical Society, and the Board of Education, have been meeting to explore the history of enslaved Africans who lived and labored in the Irvington area. Irvington residents Kathy Sears and Sarah Cox did extensive research, which is summarized in an article in the winter 2019 edition of The Roost entitled Our Town and Slavery. They will also be presenting their research on June 18th, 7 p.m. at the Irvington Public Library. Their research uncovered the names of 15 colonial era enslaved Africans, a small number of the many other enslaved people who lived in the Irvington area but whose names remain unknown. Hannah, Betty, Dick, David, Team, Brebe, David, Bill, Jack, Betty, Bet, Caesar, Hannah, Dinah, and Susanna were enslaved by Irvington's well-known founding families, Buckout, Odell, Rico, <coughs> Van Tassel, and Harms. Other slave-owning families include Acker, Jewel, Steinmetz, and Wilsey. 
Kathy and Sarah's research also suggests that there was a burial ground for enslaved Africans on the former property of Jan Buckout, on which he and his jewel descendants lived from 1708 to the 1850s. Kathy and Sarah led tours to this burial ground during the 2018 Celebrate Irvington Day. It was a solemn and moving reminder of the lost but not forgotten history of Irvington's enslaved Africans. The work of this committee as a whole is part of a broader national movement throughout the Hudson Valley region and our own county to bring to light parts of our nation's history that have been insufficiently researched, studied, and commemorated, despite the resources that exist to facilitate their further exploration. Until recently, we have given too little attention as a society to the names, identities, and experiences of enslaved Africans. Just as history tends to be written by the victors, so too do our history doc historical documents and monuments. As a result, our historical memories tend to reflect the experiences and perspectives <coughs> of the landowners and slaveholders rather than the human beings who were enslaved. Locally, one would only need to look at the many street names in Irvington for an example of the way in which historical memory is shaped. In recent years, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, the African Burial Ground National Monument in Lower Manhattan, and the African American Heritage Trail right here in Westchester County, to cite a few of the many national forms of reckoning, have helped fill in the missing portions of our national history and to situate our current moment in a more honest and complete historical context. They are also providing spaces for people to engage with these underrepresented facets of our history and to commemorate and mourn. Last year, artists unveiled separate memorials to name and remember the people enslaved by the Phillips family at both the upper and lower mill sites. Paul Growald's Stopping Stones installation at Phillipsburg Manor and two of Vinnie Bagwell's five planned sculptures for the enslaved African <coughs> Green Garden, which, were formally, which will formally open in November at the Yonkers waterfront. We are humbled by the intensity, scope, and the importance of the work being done and honored to be able to make a contribution to it right here in Irvington. Our Recognizing Enslaved Africans in Irvington Committee has been discussing ways of commemorating this important history. We are proposing that the Village Board of Trustees consider authorizing this committee to collaborate with other existing village boards to develop, design, and find location options for sculpture, <coughs> plaque, or other commemorative marker. We are envisioning a place of prominence and honor, preferably on Main Street. A separate subcommittee has already been created to facilitate fundraising and grant writing. We will be approaching the New York State Council on the Arts, Arts Westchester, Westchester, excuse me, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, among other entities. We are also in contact with artist and educator Vinnie Bagwell and the Westchester County African American Advisory Board. Please let us know next, next steps forward. We are available to attend a regular village board meeting or a work session to meet and discuss this further. Thank you very much. <coughs> where, was, where was the actual um, burial ground? There? It's right across from uh, the yoga, what's it called now, the okay. yoga zone? Yeah, so by that, you were kind of telling me something. Yeah, yeah, yeah so just basically the, right where that glassy is area is, just yeah. across the stream and right just right up there. You could probably throw a football. I mean, it was all dug up and destroyed when the Cosmopolitan building was put in and the old Buckout house was moved across the creek there and up to its current location on South Cotnet Street. So in, in and about all of that uh, exav excavation is when quote unquote skulls and bones were dug up and discarded. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, I, you know, I've only had some nodding <laughs> myself uh, officially, but I see a nodding head over here, so that's three without looking to my left. So um, I think we're all very supportive of doing something here. Um, you know, I think that doing something, I mean, it might, it might end up being two things, because if we want to have something on Main Street, I think that that's fine, but I think it also seems very appropriate to have something yes. where the, mm -hmm. the actual burial ground probably was as well. Yes, um, yeah, so. and that could even just be a much smaller sort of exactly. plaque, just as a exactly. place. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll, I think our next um, work session is jammed, but maybe even our next regular meeting uh, we can look at if it's late like this, maybe we can have you guys, if you're ready now. Yeah. Uh, but Anytime. we can, uh, you know, I think the message to take back to the committee is that this board is <laughs> um, and, you know, we want to do something appropriate um, that, you know, I think, I think there's an interesting 
kind of mix of, of, of commemorating and kind of celebrating the legacy too. You know, so it's, a, it's an interesting right. thing to get right. So, yes, exactly. Um, so and we'll get the experts in on it. Exactly. Yeah. So we look forward to working with you on this project. Great. So Thank you very it's much. It's a question of a work session or a regular meeting. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think the mayor's right. The next work session is very full. So. If we're going to talk about it, we'll maybe looking at it in the context of a regular meeting. But if the regular meeting is light enough, then we can do that. No, yeah. There can be time this, for discussion. Or the work session after that. In, in right, which would be in June. So we'd have yeah. to look. Yeah. And I don't know what's on that agenda yet. So. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, okay. That, that, maybe, you know, that day would be June 12th. If you just want to kind of have it. Otherwise, you know, maybe even as early as May 20th, our next regular meeting. If it's. I think. Well, I'm going to be out of. Oh, so we won't do that. So, so maybe maybe we'll look in July. Maybe oh, July. Oh, okay. okay. I'd be fine too. You know. If June 12th is not good for you. Well, Kathy and I are working so hard to okay. get this presentation together. Perfect. So we will do so it. I guess you, I'll give you okay. the date of the July one as well, because the July dates are a little wacky. Um, it's actually the 10th. It's 10th. Cool. Yeah, yeah, right. 10th. Okay, that's a work session, is, and that's yes. here? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll have it so on we'll, the we'll, calendar. We'll kind of do that for yeah. now. But we're we're being in touch. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Just to commend you for that article in the verse was just an extraordinary. Oh, thank you. It was not only just well written and persuasive, it was so well researched, so well presented, and so Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Janice. I was going to mention that um, in Yonkers, if you go to the Yonkers Library now, you can see Vinnie, Vinnie Bagwell's uh, two of her statues. Um, I had met with with uh, Miss Bagwell and spent quite a, a time, interesting time with her, and. She talked a lot about how she <coughs> developed the stories, and there's actually a whole audio that she had a an artist friend who does all kinds of interesting media things create to go along with the characters. She only had a little bit of information. I'm just using that as an example that the physical thing that people can see, especially kids but adults too, that make you wonder about that person as an individual. Um, sometimes that's what grabs kids. I know going to, uh, what were you saying? I was saying when I was, when you went I think I was to, five or six years old, I went to Phillipsburg Manor. Right, and they and had, where you know, slaves, They had slaves there. And what? I was like, this is New York, we have slaves. You know, and it was like this big conversation. My mom was a history teacher, so it was, I got quite an earful for a six year old. But it was, you know, I think it was interesting to think about because I think sometimes here up north, uh, us Yankees kind of, you know, look down our noses at the south quite a bit. And, um, you know, I think we, it's important to embrace our history as well. Um, I actually think, you know, being that this was really a Dutch colony when this was kind of a big area here, um, I think the way that the Netherlands has gone about uh, kind of taking it head on is really interesting. Um, it's, it, I was, when I was in Amsterdam, it was, to me it was one of the most interesting things. They had a lot of kind of museums talking about like their dark period, and it was just to me very, very interesting. Where England seems to have kind of more forgotten about it than, than kind of embraced it. But it's just, it's just interesting how you know we're still dealing with it, you know, hundreds of like 150 it's years later or whatever. And, and it's uh, this is a, this is a great step to kind of get it back out. Not into the spotlight, that's not the way to put it, but well, to, to... I'm just suggesting you find yourself in Yonkers, walk into the lobby of their library, and eventually you'll be able to go on the waterfront and see these uh, statues placed, but they they do make a, a very poignant statement. So anyway, Thanks for I look forward to our Thank you. continuing discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, from Cheryl Brandywine, uh, gas leaf blower regulations. Dear Mayor Smith and members of the Board of Trustees, this winter, the village employees used gas leaf blowers to remove, remove less than an inch of snow on South Buckhouse Street near Station Road. After reviewing the village gas leaf blower regulations, I understand this is permitted use. While a shovel may take more effort, I hope you'll consider banning use of such a polluting means of snow removal. Excess and noise and pollution from gas leaf blowers is bad enough during the spring and fall. There seems to be no reason to use them during the winter. Thank you for considering this change to the gas leaf blower regulation. Sherry, Cheryl Brandywine, 85 South Park. Yeah. This is correspondence. Uh, public comments. Hello. 
I'm Lisa again. I just wanted to flag that um, I brought some comments to make during the discussion on the gas leaf blowers that's already um, noticed in the meeting. So um, I just want to ask for the opportunity to address that then after we hear um, the board's comments on that issue. Okay. Well, that allows us to move on the consent agenda. Are there any questions or comments on this? Otherwise, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. If I have a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Equipment and volunteer firefighter. Uh, resolve to approve the following new probationary member of the Urban Fire Company named Joshua Varelis. Uh, I will make a motion if I get a second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Larry, the presentation of the annual stormwater report for fiscal 2018-19. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to do things a little bit differently this year, um, and I'm, I'm going to give you a uh, an overview of what the report is about. Uh, and, and invite you and anyone to, to take a look at the report in detail, uh, having known what the report is actually about. So I'm not, uh, we, we don't have a document to flip through by design, um, but I'll just explain what the, what the basis is uh, behind this report and, and talk about a couple of specifics that relate to our report. So um, this report that we prepare annually, and it's, this is now uh, probably somewhere short of 15 years that we've been preparing this report uh, is posted on the village website, the draft of it, and it's a required document that needs to be submitted by the end of May. Uh, and the sole purpose, uh, well, it's a few purposes, but the sole reason why we need to uh, prepare this document is that we own and operate a stormwater collection system, which is our storm drains out in the, out in the street. And those, uh, the water that's collected in the storm drains empty into the waters of the United States, which is the Hudson River. So that's the basis under which we're required to do that. So anyone that has a system of a certain size needs to prepare a report like this. Um, it could be a private property owner, but uh, <coughs> not typically. So um, the, re the uh, requirements uh, for owning such a collection system are that we uh, do a certain amount of outreach to the community to make sure that the community is aware that uh, dumping things into storm, dra storm drains is not a good idea, that uh, you know, throwing things into a stream that might be behind their house, which eventually leads into a storm drain, which might enter into the Hudson River, is not a good idea. So um, we document um, the ways in which we do this outreach. And it's sometimes there are special events, like learning how to mulch your leaves or cleaning up trails in the woods. And other times, it's emails that we may send out with, uh, with information to the community. Uh, and even presenting this report and discussing this report is actually considered a form of outreach. Um, the, um, that, so that's the public education part of the report. The next part of the report is to identify um, what are called illicit discharges. So um, situations where you may have a leak and really trying to identify a leak of, of some substance that's not good and identifying it early so it can be uh, cleaned up quickly and, and caught. So uh, one of the ways that that's done is we identify all of the locations where there may be uh, uh, outflows of stormwater that flow into our, into our storm, uh, storm drain system. We identify those areas where water flows after it's rained and we've identified about 40 of those locations that enter into our storm drains. And I'm not talking about every single catch basin, of course, but there's other areas that flow off of private property that enter into our public storm system. And uh, those 40 locations are identified and mapped, and we inspect them during periods that are dry. It hasn't been inspected recently as well. <laughs> so, uh, and, and of course, if something's running, well, it's a a dry period, then there could be an indication that there's a problem. So that's one way we catch it. Of course, other ways are if, if someone sees a substance like that has a sheen, like, like a gasoline substance or something like that, uh, if that gets reported, of course, we go out and investigate it. So we've documented the number of outflows that we've had, and we've documented the number of inspections that we've made and the number of illicit discharges that we've seen, which were zero, fortunately, in this past year. Um, we also monitor construction sites, um, and specifically construction sites that are, dis <laughs> that are disturbing and in excess of an acre. 
Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean properties of an acre, but disturbances of an acre. And right now there's one active construction site that is disturbing more than an acre, and I'm sure you could guess it's 30-40 South Broadway, um, the townhome construction. Uh, so that they have a, an active stormwater permit, and we have uh, our building department and our engineers inspecting that when there's construction activity to make sure that the stormwater is being handled properly and, uh, you know, even in time times of downpour. Um, we also inspect uh, detention ponds that are that are on private property um, that are of a certain size and documented as such and there are three such items th three such ponds that are that are out there that we inspect annually. Um, there is more work for us to do there. We do need to to make sure that uh, maintenance is done on those ponds and that we uh, are in the process of um, developing that outreach to make sure that the pond owner is maintaining their, their detention basin the way it should be. Um, but this report documents all of that and, and gives a course of action for what we're going to do. Um, the, uh, really the last area is they devote an entire section to municipal activities. Um, apparently what we do is important enough to have its own chapter. So. Um, we document, for example, the, the number of parking, the, the size of parking lots that we sweep with our street sweeper. We document the, uh, the mileage of the number of streets that we sweep with our, with our sweeper. Um, we have all of our catch basin locations mapped. There's 684 catch basins. We have them all mapped, and they're all cleaned at least once a year. In fact, some are cleaned many times during the year. And that's to, to pull out all the sediment that builds up in the bottom. And uh, that's, that's really what this report summarizes. So you're, you're more than welcome and invited to go take a look <laughs> like at the report. The it's a, I've said it before, I've used this word before, it's an extremely sterile report. Um, <laughs> it is, it, it's, it's really, it looks like a computer punch form in the old days. So that's it. Well done. Any questions? No. I would bite it. Yes, I was going to say. Was it the tone of my voice? <laughs> was it the tone of my voice that made it uninviting? <laughs> we, we do appreciate the evolution of how it's been presented. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, experts present it, and it, it goes a little bit over the top. So. Much better. Well, try, try to improve it each year. So. But any questions, seriously, take a look at it if you're curious about what it is that we're doing or if there's, you think there's something we're not doing. Uh, take a look and, and yeah. let me know. Yeah. The signs related to pick up the dog poop is related to yes. this, mm -hmm. too. That's part of public it's outreach, yep. Good education piece for the <laughs> community. So I guess I just said two, one request and one question. is request is, uh, with the summary kind of presentation, maybe um, you probably would, but if there's anything that's an anomaly that sticks out from year to year, it'd be really important to yes. highlight that. Definitely. And the other thing is, what are we doing in terms of education for people to make them um, aware that they need to clear out uh, debris out of water channels, such as right. Bernie Burke? Right. So um, that's actually an area that um, uh, part of our the grant that we received money uh, for the replacement of the culvert near Hudson View Park, which is hopefully going to be underway in the next month or so. Um, part of that grant actually requires uh, a collaboration with Mercy College and the students at Mercy College particularly um, to help us develop some outreach materials. I know it seems a little um, uh, a little convoluted in that regard, but that actually was a was a uh, something that the the grant encouraged in terms of collaborating with a local uh, educational institution. So we will be undertaking that and, and the materials that are produced that will of course be vetted and we're not going to just take it out of the hands of a student and, and deliver it, but yeah. it's um, it, that'll give us a good start. Yeah, I'm just going to suggest also there's some folks on G, GPTF committee that have experience in mm -hmm. stormwater stuff, so that would be worthwhile to let them get involved in the vetting as materials or the brainstorming, if, it, if that's so required. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Do we have to make any kind of motions or is no. this just No. Nope. We don't have to accept it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would have actually given you a copy. 
to have in front of you if that was the nice. uh, next item is the approval of contract 2019-06 with Pascali Drillac for the farmers market management services uh, this looked to me it looked like the same as it's the same contract years. yeah and it came directly from the farmers market but it's, I believe it's the same contract with the same scope of services um, so that's it that was part of the consent agenda. Oh, oh, that was sorry. Is there a question about it? No, no, no. I haven't done the skip things. Any yeah. questions about this contract? Or? Results of group contract 2019 06 with Pascal and Drillek for Farmers Market Management Services and Authorized Village Administrator to execute the contract. Uh, I'll make a motion if I have a second. Second. All in favor? The word of contract for auto parts. Yeah, I, this is one of our routine contracts that we uh, that are required. We, we of course, um, the uh, amount of any individual auto part that we purchase does not rise above a bid level of twenty thousand um, dollars. But the because we purchase more than twenty thousand dollars of auto parts as a as a commodity, uh, it requires us. The New York State law requires us to go out to bid. So um, we we did assemble a bid document. The bid document is. Um, uh, it was fairly specific as to the location of the supplier because, as you can imagine, you know, although we may get a better price from a, a distributor from, you know, Arizona, it, it's, it doesn't help us too much when we need to fix something uh, in short order. So the uh, suppliers that we have identified are local. This is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> Whereas sealed bids were received and opened on April 24, 2019, and the bill as follows Company Brent Auto and truck from Port Chester, uh, dis discount 30% off retail, and Shelts Ford Lincoln of Nanuet, New York, for list minus 30% for Ford Lincoln parts only. <laughs> whereas the village administrator has reviewed the bids submitted and determined that all bids are responsive to specifications, and whereas the central garage needs to purchase parts for a variety of different vehicle makes and models, necessitating the designation of multiple su suppliers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the village administrator is authorized to execute a purchase contract. For auto parts with each of the two suppliers on the terms outlined above through May 31st, 2020. I'll make a motion to bring out a second. Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. It's a review of gas powered beef blower regulations. So, this item's on the agenda um, mainly to uh, really get a sense of, of uh, where the entire board wants to go with this uh, these set of regulations. As you know, the, the law was adopted in 2017. There was a, uh, specifically, there was a sunset provision for, uh, uh, or I should say a change in the, in the, uh, the rated decibel level uh, that reduced the rated de decibel level that was allowed for any leaf flower from 70 um, down to 65 dB. Um, and so I, I think in, um, in some of the past correspondence, my understanding was that there, was, uh, there are models on the market that would satisfy that requirement. Uh, the, there's a, a recent contention that there aren't models available, and so that might effectively uh, eliminate the use of any leaf blowers, uh, gas-powered leaf blowers. Uh, so I think that, that was really the issue that I needed to get some clarification on personally, and there may be other reasons to open up other areas of this. but. Uh, that was the main purpose. Well, it does seem we come back to the nuclear law at least once a year. Um, <coughs> you know, I think that, uh, you know, whether we, we talk about this practical um, enforcement of the law and the way the enforcement has actually been working in practice, which is really just like a noise, nuisance law almost, where um, regardless of it's electric or gas, typically the police just ask the people to stop using it and they have in the past complied. Um, we have gotten calls, uh, there's actually, there seems to be one person who, who's probably 80% of all of the calls, um, but they call on any type, electric, gas, doesn't matter the time or use. So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we come back to, you know, with the, let's say that there is hypothetically a 60 decibel, uh, decibel um, model um, how are we going to have our police enforce that? We're going to have them go out, see them using it, which often by the time they get there, no one's blowing anymore anyway. Um, so now they're going to call that out 
um, but they're going to say, hey, can you give me your you know, model and serial number? They're going to go back to their car and Google it and then say, yes, this one complies, carry on. Um, you know, it just seems like it's a lot of work for you know, something that's kind of hard to comply with anyway. Um, you know, so it almost seems like you know, we're at the point where do we want to go with an outright ban, which would be obviously a lot simpler, a lot easier to enforce. Um, you know, an outright ban all year, an outright ban trip seasons. Um, you know, I think we, we tried to do when we passed this law was allow the person that uses their leaf blower, you know, when their grandkids come over once every other month to blow off their patio to not be in violation of the law, while cracking down on what we really think of the, the, the handful of bad operators that come with three backpacks and two, two handhelds, and, and, you know, every time they you know, clip a little bit of grass, they're blowing for 10 minutes anyway. Um, you know, and I think, you know, kind of those two ends of the spectrum are what we were trying to satisfy. And, you know, we kind of come up with a, with a very complicated law um, that is hard to understand, it's hard to, to have enforcement. Um, you know, so it's, it's not that we, you know, didn't try our best. I think we probably tried too hard on it. Um, and try to have too many compromises and too many loopholes and too many, you know, satisfy too many different constituents um, that we're kind of back to not quite square one, but square three maybe. Um, you know, and, and it's just, you know, it keeps coming up. And I, I know there are, there are people that feel very strongly. I mean, we, it was interesting. I think looking at Paul Feiner um, was looking to ban them town of Greenberg wide, which we actually think would make it a lot easier because, or have regulations to Greenberg wide because. You go from, you know, you cross the street in RC Park and you're in Dobbs Ferry and they have different regulations than they do in Irvington. Um, you know, it's just tough even for the, the, the contractors that are trying to do the right thing um, to do the right thing. So, uh, but Paul Feiner found the exact same thing we did. About a third of the people said, um, I want to be able to blow anything I want anytime I want. A third of the people said, no one should ever be able to use, you know, any kind of blowers, electric, gas, whatever. Uh, then a third of the people kind of shrugged. So, you know, um, you know so we're kind of left now with a law that is difficult to enforce. I don't think it makes anybody happy, um, you know, except us because we finally got something passed that we have to talk about it for a couple of months. But, you know, I, I, I personally, um, you know, I don't feel that strongly. I, I think that I'm, I'm disappointed in the overuse of them. But, you know, I, I, I've always been sympathetic to, you know, Grandpa Jones that wants to blow off his patio once a month, you know, so it's, and yes, he probably could use an electric, but we're not going to tell Grandpa Jones that he has to go buy an electric one. Um, you know, so it's, it's that's that's kind of where I've, I've never had a super strong feeling either way. I do feel some of the statistics that I've read are inflated, and when I try to find them, they seem to be kind of, yeah, science, you know, um, but there's definitely some, there's some black and white science that these aren't the best things to be using, but there's others that are, you know, some it seems like that would really me. Um, but. So one consideration that I, I know was on our minds back then, way back when, was, was this a hardship on the small businesses that were the contractors that all of a sudden they were going to have to buy different kinds of equipment and now that was, when we passed this, 2017? Um, it seems like that issue has dissipated quite a bit during that time. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of sense that communities are going this way to make them either outright banned or less um, able to be used. So, um, I mean, I haven't had, I don't know how much we're going to, um, are we going to spend a whole other um, session on this or how this is going to go, but do we have any sense about how the um, contractors can handle this kind of equipment financially and still be viable businesses. Do we know anything about that? A little bit. Um, Argento's, which both has a, a lawn care business but also has uh, a, a big store in the White Plains, uh, actually in Greenberg, I guess. Um, that sells to the trade. Uh, I have not talked to them recently, but I know, I'm pretty sure that uh, GPTF has, and um, what uh, Argento is reporting is that there are more and more uh, landscapers who are starting to buy electric. Um, I was looking at the uh, uh, 
current costs of the professional grade equipment, and the costs are for the uh, you know leaf blower itself uh, pretty compatible. It might be a little bit more than a, than a gas uh, two-stroke. The, the real cost comes in with the battery pack because in order to have this uh, stuff be able to be viable over an extended period of time, you basically have to have a backpack battery. Um, and, you know, the, the current prices, and again, this is not from Argenta, this is just what is seen online in other sources. Um, you know, they're for an all day type of backpack, it's uh, probably um, about $1,200 for the. For the uh, unit and then battery and the charger, 12, 12 to 1500 So, you know, there is an investment, but it's not, you know, when you look at the gas blowers, the point is that it's not, you know, I, I was going to take exception slightly to your characterization, Brian, only because um, the cost of ownership of a gas leaf blower, there's an inherent cost of ownership in terms of the gas and the oil, obviously, and in terms of the maintenance, the fact that if you're not using it continually, and even if you are using it, you're probably going to have to do uh, cleanups and carburetor replacements, spark plug replacements, and stuff like that on an annual basis. Someone who is operating quite a bit frequently, you know, the, the common thought, and we discussed it last time we talked about this, is a gas leaf blower maybe has a lifespan of, you know, 12 to 18 months in professional use just because it's used so continually. It, they, uh, you know, they're basically burned out. Um, but for homeowners, if they're actually only using it once or twice a year, you've got a secondary problem because if you don't use those gas engines, they gum up, and you know you basically can't really restart them. And so then you have a so it's a hidden kind of thing to say, it, you know, anyone who's like a homeowner that basically has 30 minutes of blowing to do, you can get a package for 150 bucks from Lowe's or from Home Depot that you can recharge overnight or recharge in a couple of hours and that thing will last you for years because it's not going to gum up the carburetor. You know, so there's a, there's a lifetime ownership issue. And then there's an issue with, uh, you know, the sound as we talked about before. I went and double checked again today and basically the only units that are really in, the, in our sound guidelines will be uh, battery operated or electric units. So. Uh, it's a. There were no gas units at 65. I couldn't find any that were, because what happens? Is, yeah, I could. You know, they all have these kind of like turbo modes and things like that. And once you get into that, that's all. That's are often compliance. They only are, if they do match the decibel ratings, it's because they're not running at full power, which. But my secondary thing that I think I have a problem with, um, you know, because I experienced it today and was thinking about it, was and look was looking out on the street, watching the the guys at work uh, up and down Harriman, and you know, one of the issues I see also in terms of just the usage pattern is once the gas leaf blower is started, their number shut off. They're left idling as you know they put them down on the ground and idle, and they're sitting around chatting or they're idling as they walk between properties. So it's never really, um, you know, because it's a bother to restart them every time. So there's, you know, that's a noise issue, but it's also a pollution issue. Those engines are extremely inefficient and polluting uh, with, uh, you know, uh, petrochemical aerosols, et cetera, et cetera, that, uh, as they run. So, you know, I, I have very little, um, I guess patience at this point with the lack of respect that the landscaping community has toward the our our residents, and I've often heard it be said that the residents can force the landscapers, but truth be told, a lot of residents aren't around during the during the weekday because they're at work. It's a, it's still at least 50 percent of commuting village, and so they may not know what the practices are. Um, but anyways, I don't know. I mean, we can go on and on about this kind of stuff. But so there's, it's just not the noise. It's the pollution aspect of things. And, you know, 
in general, things like lawnmowers are not included in that because they're four-stroke and tend to have a lot better uh, pollution control on them than the two-stroke engines do. So, um, anyways, I don't know where we want to go with this. I think that it's untenable the way the law is written right now in terms of enforcement. And um, it's so exception-heavy in any case. So uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what uh, to say except that uh, potentially out, uh, you know, manning any gas would at least uh, make an easier regulation, although I don't know if it would solve some of the other problems. So I had, you know, just to follow my, my thought about the whether or not we were being very um, hurtful to a small business um, that we thought about two years ago. Um, I'm feeling that those, those small businesses have to evolve anyway because of other communities that have rather strict laws. So I'm thinking that given the complication of trying to figure out which ones are what's okay and what the, why don't we just ban the gas ones all together and make the law a little simpler. <laughs> Seems like one way to go. Well, I, you know, I would add uh, a couple of things. One, I'm still not sure that the battery-operated leaf blowers can generate enough power to, to do what a commercial gas leaf blower can do. With that said, um, I certainly think that individual homeowners who right now are excluded from from the ban on gas leaf blowers um, can certainly buy an electric leaf blower at a reasonable cost. And I think, you know, as Mark said, for the people who are going to be doing it, you know, uh, um, or as Brian said, Grandpa Jones cleaning off his deck, I think he can just as easily, you know, invest $150 going forward and, uh, you know, do it with a battery leaf blower. The other thing I would say is, you know, in my mind, when we did add that, that sunset law, uh, lowering it from 70 to 65, um, I did envision that we'd be coming back as we are now and uh, having a serious discussion about banning gas leaf blowers and making them all electric. That you did or didn't? I did. did. You did. Yeah, yeah. that's why right. I thought right. okay, that we did that. Right. So, so we have that so discussion. It, it, one, one thing, and then just let me just follow up on one thing. I was looking specifically at power, uh, airflow, uh, speed out of the nozzle, you know. And um, basically, not all electrics are, are powerful enough, but there are within any particular model line, like makers like Style or, or Ego, they have multiple models that have velocities that are above, like 140 uh, miles per hour. And this is about 168. Yeah, exactly. You get, you so get it at the Home Depot. Yeah, so, yeah, so they're very. Yeah. So some of the smaller units, no, they don't right. have that velocity that you would want in a professional unit. Right. So we're now approaching two years since we had this law, where there's an average 12 to 18 month life of a commercial gas leaf blower. Yeah, exactly. um, so I think at this point, you know, all replacements, and I understand, you know, for a commercial you know, operation that there is an increased expense at this point in time, uh, you know, due to the limitation of, of battery and battery life and the need to purchase, you know, extras and have charged battery, you know, perhaps a second battery that can replace while the first one's being charged. Um, but again, I think this is the reason that we had this um, sunset, and uh, I think this is the discussion that we need to have now. If I may, because um, I've been giving this a, a lot of thought, and like Brian um, had mentioned about the correspondence in response to Paul Feiner's proposal, I went through them also, and it was really fascinating. It was almost like a classic bell curve. There were 85 people who said, ban them. There were 57 people who said, don't ban them. The extreme position was, you take my gas blowing leaf blower out of my cold dead hands, <laughs> and it's classic governmental overregulation. and who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing, on the one hand. 
On the other hand, it was, if you don't ban these things, you are murdering me and my children and destroying the environment. <coughs> In between, most people who wanted to ban them said, or at least regulate them, and most people who didn't want them banned said, but we understand you need to regulate them. I mean, there really was a middle ground. One thing I was thinking about, though, is that there's a lot of things that go on everywhere here that are bad for the environment, that cause pollution. Nobody is talking about telling anybody they can't continue to drive their gas guzzler, right? We wouldn't do that. One of the reasons that... Yeah, we, but we tell them that they can't idle their car. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but the point is, all of us make choices, not all of which are um, good for the environment or where we could engage in better practices if we so choose. And, you know, there's a range of things. I think the reason that this issue is the one that comes to the surface is because it's a nuisance. You know, it, it, it bothers people, and I really do get that. So, but let's not pretend this is, I don't mean pretend, but this isn't just about doing environmental best practices. This is also about trying not to drive our neighbors crazy. That's fine, that's a good thing. But it's not simply that this we should be doing this because it's good, good for the environment. Enforcement is obviously impossible. Um, also, it just so happens that my neighbors don't use any kind of blowers, and they do all of their yard work themselves. They're out there with rakes. They're out there mulching. They're out there like, I will tell you, I think they're both retired, because this takes an enormous amount of time to do it, to do it yourself. And, and that probably increases the resale value of your house. <laughs> yeah, my neighbor's real quiet. Don't want my to come their and stay. Work. They're going to come and visit you, I know, the neighborhood. Um, so this has clearly been impossible to enforce. When we talk about the cost to the, um, the, the companies that do this, though, I would keep in mind that many of these are small businesses. They're not the big lawn maintenance companies. They're, you know, a few guys who are doing this, and this could have a real impact on them. Again, I'm not arguing that's a reason not to do it, but I think as with most things, we have to balance the goods and the effects of the actions that we take. Um, also, the comments from the Greenberg, um, one of the comments, and Mark, you've spoken to this a bit, but the, ele the electric blowers are not as efficient, and it seems like they are getting more efficient, um, which, is, which is comforting. Um, Efficiency on what aspect? Because as I said, there's a whole range of them that are now more, even as powerful, if not more powerful. 168 miles per hour out of the nozzle is actually, its selling point is it's more powerful than, you know, you know, 80 plus percent of the gas units out there. So but wouldn't it be, I'm assuming that this is sort of commonsensical, that the more efficient electric ones are going to be more expensive? I see. I don't know what you mean by efficient. Do you mean the more powerful ones or the ones that operate on more efficiently with battery? Because they're contradictory. The more power you put to a fan, it, the quicker the battery If you're going to replace your gas leaf blower and you want to replace it with something that can do the same job in the same amount of time, that's the efficiency she's talking about. That's the efficiency. So it's just, you're talking about labor efficiency. Yes. And not power efficiency. Which I think that's what the uh, landscape we're talking about as yeah, well. Because you, know, you don't want to be that, you don't want to be at the house for 40 minutes if you used to be there for 15. But, but there's, there's another problem, and that we've talked about well, it before. Well, just before we get off that one, yeah. is it a correct assumption, and it is an assumption on my part, that the more powerful units are going to be more expensive? That seems to be the price range I gave you for units about Four hundred fifty dollars for the blower and about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred for for the backpack. Okay. Uh, the, the units themselves are about four fifty, and that's or for whatever you go four eighty nine, four fifty, some range like that for the most powerful ones, and they drop all the way down to being like, you know, a homeowner can get them now for eighty bucks. So but it's different use by a homeowner who wants I, I to just I understand that. I'm just saying there's a range of prices. Right. And that, but that a, 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 a contracting group that's maybe a, a, a 10 guys employed in this who might have to replace 10, 
10 um, units and it has to be where they can do this, the same amount of houses in the same amount of time? Well, the problem is also is, you know, there's another aspect to it is that it's the bad behavior in terms of, and I'm putting that in quotes, but in terms of using your, turning your blower on for half an hour, walking around, one, I was, literally went on for 15 minutes at my neighbor's site, uh, house across the street. They were just blowing leaves from under the trees back and forth. They were just spending time looking like they were doing something. So, you know, maybe the point is that when there's a more of a cost to the labor time, i.e., don't waste your battery, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, maybe they'll start thinking about the fact that just looking busy isn't the same thing as, as providing any benefit to the, uh, to the client. Okay, I get your example. I'm not sure I accept that as universal behavior of landscapers. <laughs> have you watched? Yes, actually Sorry. I have. We've actually, yeah, I've asked my landscaper not to blow, like, you know, with yeah. the, you know except, yeah. except in this, you know, maybe for fall cleanup, yeah. and they still do it every single time. You know, I thought it was interesting that in, in Paul Finer's letters, uh, I think on that first batch he had sent out, he had surveyed I think it was Scarsdale that has a gas ban, and the administrator he spoke to from Scarsdale gave him statistics, and he basic the, the gist I got of the letter was that Scarsdale said, we made this law, and this is the law as it is now, and landscapers choose to obey it or not, and if they choose to not obey it, they get fined, and when they get fined, they consider it the cost of doing business and either pass on that cost or, you know, or not, but that they pass their law and that's their law and they're going from there, you know. They didn't say it was best, it was worse, but they said that everyone knows it and it gets enforced in, you know, in various ways, mostly by complaints. But, but there were fines. I remember he gave a list of the number of fines over the course of, I guess it was five years that they had done it. Can I correct one thing, Larry? Sorry. That the ban in effect in um, Scarsdale is only in effect from June 1st through September 30th. It's not a total ban. Yeah. yeah. Seasonal. Yep. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that you know, I, we're going to have a work section on this, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, and I think we probably so can, we can probably do a, a quick uh, look at, you know, surrounding laws again. Um, we, I, my understanding is that they, I have to confirm this, but the village officials committee was trying to come up with a standardized law for the river towns. Um, I thought they booted that. They did. They because it was, they were all so different. That, um, and that was for it to Hastings. The had nothing, Thanks. but yeah, but from Hastings to uh, City Hollow, we try to kind of get one law so that again, the landscapers, everybody could be on one page. And it was, Tarrytown said, we don't want to ever talk about this ever again because it was such a <laughs> horrible law. You know, like it was just, again, you had this side of the room screaming that one thing and this side of the room screaming the other thing. Um, so they're like, we don't want to, we're not going to touch our law. So if you want to match ours, you can. Um, but that was, yeah, so it didn't get very far. Has any town or any community looked at, is there a way, as well as science, I'm not suggesting I don't, but is there a carrot as well as a stick? Is there a way to positively create incentives for people to either switch over or to um, comply? Well, we did say in our own law, if you're electric, you don't have any of the uh, blackout limitations. Isn't that one of the clauses in the law? You use your electric every day. Yeah, none of this no, applies. No, it isn't because the, the law that is written only applies to gas power. Right. So it so, means that there's no so limitations on electric. It's right. just gas power. Right. So that's, that's a benefit. Yes. They could blow in the middle of the blackout <laughs> period if they wanted yeah. to. It's their own battery. And even if there's a blackout. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy if the rest of you are to hear a little bit of information from Lisa if she is sure. more willing since she's sure. here and offering. Um, and she was very clear who she is. I yeah, yeah, that she was around, around just in a very that. polite way. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, so, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the board tonight. 
Yes, I think you know my name is Lisa Gang. I live with my husband and our two young children at 61 Havemeyer Road uh, by Halsey Pond. At the end of the summer, it's going to be three years since we moved from the city to Irvington. Um, and the primary motivation that we had for moving was to be closer to nature. Um, and that was how we ended up with an acre of land uh, ringed by beautiful mature trees, having no idea what that meant in the fall. Um, so what we didn't know about when we made that choice was how maintaining our property and the use of gas leaf blowers in our neighborhood would directly affect our health and the well-being of our family. Um, this board knows a lot about gas leaf blowers. I'm going to go through quickly go through even some of the things that I wrote about them. You know about what's been euphemistically called their unique sound profile. Um, I often work from home myself. I spend a lot of time at home with uh, my children during the times that gas leaf blowers are allowed, in the seasons that they're allowed, and I can attest myself to the intensity of the sound that has had me ushering crying children back inside the house, holding their ears. Then when we got inside the house, we discovered that amazingly the sound penetrates walls and windows. And I live in a part of town where every property is about an acre, so sometimes the leaf blowers were two or three um, neighbors' houses and properties down, and they were still resoundingly loud um, where I am. So there's certainly no question of being able to be outside um, when that work is going on, and it goes on often for long periods of time. Again, these are big properties. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the board so much for um, continuing to discuss this issue, which I knew was painful. Um, and uh, I also wanted to say that the remarks that I prepared obviously were not responsive to some of the things that were discussed, and we didn't know the direction that the board was taking, so I'm going to um, sort of weave in between what I prepared and, and trying to address some of these points um, on which maybe I have a little bit more information as well. Um, so as the board knows, the use and misuse of gas leaf blowers can really upset the balance between the competing interests of people who want to enjoy a safe and healthy environment and people who are attached to the ways that they maintain their properties. And that's why this board worked so hard in 2017 to enact the ordinance that it did. Um, there is still a range of views in the community about wh whether the ordinances are strict enough. Um, and I want to say that what I came prepared to talk about is what would it mean for the existing ordinances to be made effective and what might be ways of securing better compliance with existing ordinances. Um, and I think the proposal that we came forward with actually would be true for any further effort that the board made. So if there was an effort to tighten the regulation, this, these, this information about how it can be made more effective would still be relevant. But before I get to enforcement, I just wanted to speak to um, a couple of issues that were brought up. Um, so in my uh, copious spare time, I spent a lot of time reading the testimony that was provided in Washington, D.C. before they passed um, an outright ban on gas leaf blowers in the summer of 2018. Uh, I don't know if the board is aware that Washington, D.C. did that, but they did that without any caveats or carve-outs for the entirety of the District of Columbia, including tens of thousands of acres of public property that had previously been maintained with um, gas leaf blowers. And one of the things that gave them comfort in doing that was that they gave a lot of notice. So in their case, the outright ban was not going to go into effect until something like three and a half years after the date of passage. And that was the way, taking into account that 12 to 18 month lifespan of a gas leaf blower, that they accounted for the sort of notice need and the interest of both homeowners and landscapers and um, not having to basically waste or throw away existing equipment so that get, being given notice, they would, as the natural um, cycle of their gas leaf blowers ran out, they would just replace them with electric blowers. So um, without saying that we need that level of notice, I think we can consider that there is already, as some of you have said, ample notice in the air and in the water, um, including with the 2017 ordinance that this is the direction communities are going. So um, this isn't going to hit anybody by surprise. Um, but I do think that some of the discussion of an outright ban versus a seasonal ban also makes sense in terms of notice because um, since landscapers know that they are allowed to use them some of the time, there's still not that same incentive to re really invest in an arsenal of electric blowers um, as there would be if they knew that at some stated point they really are going to have to make a full um, switch over. Um, so, you know. One of the other things that came out very clearly um, in the DC testimony that I wasn't aware of was more information about that unique sound profile of the, of the gas blower versus electric. I had always focused on the decibels, but not so much in the fact that they are low frequency, and that is what makes them uniquely um, penetrating of walls and windows. Obviously, they were being studied um, in a dense urban environment, but there was a really rigorous acoustic study that was done, 
and they found that a gas leak blower was heard by 93 residents, you know, from, you know, spot zero where it was being used versus an electric blower that only affected about two to three households. So I can say again from personal experience living in an area that's quite sparse that, that I hear the way that that sound travels. Um, there was a question that Connie had at the very beginning. Oh, like, does well, anybody would know? Companies, would the companies have had enough time to, when we did this back in 2017, and the fact that there are other communities that are either going this way or have right. gone this way that, you know, maybe now it wouldn't hurt them so much as it would have yeah. years ago. Yeah, and there was in D.C. There's also actually a lot of testimony from landscapers who had whether for reasons of competitive advantage, because they understand that there is a new market for more sustainable landscaping practices, or because they had actually themselves experienced devastating hearing loss. I mean, even the owners who had operated these machines, um, a lot of landscapers testified to the efficacy of electric blowers and who were sort of um, debunking a little bit this idea that the only alternative is going back to the raking method that would take forever and we're saying we're really able to do our work, we're able to do it on large plots of land as well um, with electric blowers and sometimes it requires being a little bit more savvy about how to work with their battery life and um, a learning curve on how to make these machines work but these were landscapers who were saying you know we feel a business imperative to move in this direction and we also for the health and safety of ourselves and our own workers um, feel that this is, is this is the right path forward and we've chosen voluntarily to become the vanguard of the industry in this respect. So um, there's a lot of information out there. All that testimony included names and um, we, and when I say we, I mean members of Irvington activists and the Green um, Policy Task Force are glad to continue to dig into that um, wealth of resources and maybe contact some of those landscapers and get more information that might be responsive to more concerns about um, what an outright ban would mean and whether the alternatives are really efficacious. But certainly there's a lot of information out, out there pointing in the direction that they are. Um, so I want to go back to this idea of enforcement and what would it mean for either the current ordinances or perhaps a future title ordinance to be effective. It means at the least that homeowners and landscapers are both fairly and properly complying with the ordinance. Um, and that they're fully informed about and understand the reasons for the ordinances and why limiting the use of gas leaf blowers is so important. Um, when um, the ordinances were first enacted, there was a lot of discussion about the need to monitor how the rules would work and the recognition that changing old practices would take ongoing efforts, which the fact that this you know, item is back on the agenda is, is also obviously reflecting. Um, and as we already talked about, um, uh, the, for the 2019 calendar year, the board, board imposed this lower threshold, so obviously there's a need to revisit that and see whether um, it's tenable to even continue to have gas leaf blowers that could theoretically comply with this newer 65 decibel limit. Um, so the board also required in the existing ordinances ongoing monitoring of landscaper compliance through the annual issuance of new registration tags. Um, and most importantly, as we heard already from Ms. Brandwine's letter and from um, from other concerned residents, not just the one who's responsible for 80% of the calls, but others as well, there is ongoing community concern and frustration with how these blowers negatively affect our health and our peace and quiet and with the difficulty of securing landscaper compliance, which is um, the non-compliance quite pervasive. Um, so putting aside for the moment whether the law should be more restrictive, there are some concrete steps that we came here to say the board could take to make sure that the current ordinance or any future ordinance um, is as effective as possible. So first, the board should direct the village administrator to write to each and every registered landscaper and ask them to certify in writing to the board that all handheld and backpack leaf blowers currently being used in Irvington comply with the noise restrictions of 65 decibels and that restrictions on the periods of the year, the seasons, and the times when gas leaf blowers are permitted and the type and number of leaf blowers being used are being fully complied with. So why do this? Why is it so important? It ensures that the requirements in the ordinances that this board passed are in fact being followed. It strongly conveys to landscapers that this board takes these requirements seriously and actually conveys to the community that the board takes seriously compliance with its regulations in general. Um, it demonstrates that the board is listening to the community residents who are in our yards and indeed in our homes every day and are concerned that the present ordinance is not being complied with or enforced. And it also has the benefit of being quite straightforward and easy to execute. 
Second, the board should work with the Green Policy Task Force and other interested residents to initiate and promote training for landscapers and homeowners, not only about the terms of the ordinance, but the reasons for the ordinance and available alternatives to gas leaf blower use. Responsible landscapers who want to operate in our community should take steps to be sure that they're doing so consistently with our community's laws in a safe way, in a safe way for their workers and for residents. Um, and the way to achieve that is further education. Um, because you know, what, one thing that came up in the course of the DC hearings is that voluntary compliance is the key to all enforcement. Um, and you know, we know from the difficulty of enforcement how wonderful it would be if we actually secured that voluntary compliance. So um, we are ready and able to produce content and to participate in every way possible in that kind of education effort that could improve the compliance rates. Um, the board should renew and champion information educational programs for homeowners about the environmental and health impacts of using gas leaf blowers and why it is important to consider if their use is necessary or can be limited. Um, and here I just wanted to go back for, for a moment to something that Janice spoke to, which is, you know, why are these things being singled out? And I think it, it's very true that they're partly being singled out because they are just such a unique nuisance uh, and not because we don't do other things that are environmentally deleterious. But I would say that, you know, in a lot of the um, expert bodies that have examined what is producing emissions and what is affecting our environment, like the CDC and the EPA in um, different administrations, have singled them out as well. So this isn't just, you know, your neighbor complaining about their neighbor, but the bodies that are charged with studying public health issues have singled them out as well because of very sort of unique polluting um, profiles. So I, I think while the, nu the nuisance point is something that probably gets the most people riled up in writing, um, I don't want to just, um, I don't want to diminish the, the reality of the en environmental effects as well. Um, and to that point, I also want to add that this is um, auspiciously for our discussion, but inauspiciously for the globe, the day that the UN released its latest report on biodiversity and um, said that there are one million species that are uh, of plants and animals that are at risk for extinction. One of the few positive things that was in that report is that the worst case scenarios may yet be averted. Um, and so I think, you know, we said, we and others like us sit in every part of this country and the globe wondering what's within our jurisdictions to affect, um, to try to avoid some of those um, most catastrophic scenarios for biodiversity. And that's another reason I think why people focus on gas leaf blowers because um, there are tiny little ecosystems that are in our yards um, and they are one of the sort of worst and most damaging kinds of equipments for those e ecosystems, excuse me. Um, so back to education efforts, while the board has posted this information on the website, there is still more that can be done to get the word out. Um, and there are groups such as um, the Green Policy Task Force, the activists, and I should mention also the Pollinator Pathway Project, ready and willing to create content and to work with the board on these educational efforts. So why is this educational piece so important? Um, changing and effectively limiting the use of gas leaf blowers as the board already determined to do even if no further steps are taken means changing long-held ideas about how we should maintain our properties. And that means educating people about why this is good for our health, the health of our children, the health of the workers, which was a really substantial topic of discussion in D.C. as well, by the way, recognizing um, that most of the actual workers who are carrying these machines are not in a bargaining position to secure a healthy, healthy work practices around them um, and are often not able to receive information even if it were going to be supplied to them in a way that they're able to understand about the health risks that they're taking by operating, operating this machinery. So I don't want to diminish that factor either. Um, and so good for people, children, workers, adults, neighbors, everybody, um, and the health of the environment as well. So thank you so much again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for reopening this discussion. Thank you for some of the really promising directions of the conversation before. And I think you, know, you won't be surprised to learn that I would be um, a fan of an outright ban, notwithstanding the fact that I have my own acre surrounded by mature trees. And I myself will be one of those homeowners who's going to have to become quickly educated. Uh, about what that would mean and how it would be done, but I'm certainly, you know, ready to rise to that challenge, and I believe that my neighbors could as well. So, thank you so much, and if there are any questions that I could answer, I'd be glad to try. Great. I mean, my biggest question is why aren't there landscapers that are selling themselves as organic, sustainable landscapers? It blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. There, there are. Some. There are. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had, the only guys yeah. I've seen are the ones that do like only, you know, kind of natural organic um, fertilizer. fertilizer. But I haven't seen anyone say, you know, I'm going to bring six guys and rake or. 
He would use electric ones. Like yeah, but there was a bunch of people that did pick up and provide, you know, uh, leaf mulching services, you know, after loving and leaving. Yeah. And uh, people saw that as a business opportunity for uh, neighbors and neighborhoods who were more concerned about the impacts of care on the local environment. It just seems like there should be some funding in heck of a lot better than that care than that. I mean, I don't know how much, if, if we're actually going to do this at another session, and how much we want to go into it now. I mean, I have some ideas, but, you know, is this the right time, or are no, we going to do it? we need to actually sit down and talk about yeah, it. I think, yeah, right. So, I mean, I have some ideas about education and making it more obvious who has, who's registered and isn't, and how do you know that that truck out there in front of your neighbor is, is a registered one or not, you know, how easy it is, you know, you go online, oh, yeah. So I don't know. There, I think there are ways to make it the whole idea of registering a more powerful part of this whole thing. You register, what do you do? How do you keep these registered people informed about what the laws are and the, and the neighbors informed about who's registered? Anyway, but I think we should scan it for tonight and um, Blow it off till next time. Yeah. <laughs> Only with electric blower. <laughs> so one thing I would like to suggest, maybe for an action item for some of the um, non-governmental ent entities here, would be to talk to, to talk to uh, like Argentos and find out because what I heard was that they were converting a lot of their uh, landscape crews to electric, and they were, and again, they're providing. Uh, a whole range of products to the landscape industry. They're right mm -hmm. across the street, effectively, from the Greenberg Police uh, mm -hmm. Department. Sort of back in a little bit. There's a little weird road that's one way in one direction. Mm -hmm. And it's in the wrong direction to get there easily. But <laughs> there's a way to get there. So it, it might be interesting, because they could have actually some very useful. Again, with Love and Living, we got the most interesting input from some of the landscapers, uh, not just the soil scientists and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, because I think people w are starting to develop a new type of best practice again. Right. Okay. So yeah. we'll get on it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, could, is there any other leg, sorry, I'm not standing up, but is there <laughs> other leg work that we could carry out to help the board with this issue beyond? I mean, I, I mean if, if I had my perfect uh, scenario, you come back here with, uh, you know, the three of the top five landscapers in Irvington that say, you know what? Um, and the, the one I've had the conversation, they say, other than the real heavy duty leaf removal in the fall, they could probably do it with electric. They said they can't, they, they claim they can't do it. So I think if we heard that there's like a sea of change, that they say, you know what, you're right. If you give us 18 months, we could have no more gas-powered leaf blowers, and we could we're yeah, confident. Let's interview the all these well, registered. Them, not all of them, but just maybe maybe get the list of registered ones from Larry. That's, you know, that's who you should talk to. <laughs> um, and you know, just to see if they've, they've you know, we have heard about improvements. Maybe that's maybe they have a change of heart as well, and they, they're not going to come in here and, and tell us how they, you know, they, they just can't do their job. And, they won't come to Irvington anymore. And I think that's the one difference between Washington, D.C. is you could have, you know, if we have 15 landscapers now, we might have six. Because it's like, you know what? It's not worth me buying all this new equipment and a $1,200 backpack if I only have eight clients in Irvington. And then if that's, you know, the, the, we don't want the prices to go up a lot either. Um, you know, that's all the us. If it really is getting better, then maybe we're, maybe we're not aware that, you know, kind of the concerns that we talked about that, Maybe the landscapers are like, we already have 90% electric. Yeah, we'll whatever. do it. You make so the law, we'll go ahead. Finding out what's practical in the field for them now. And there might be one that's super like, you know, uh, advanced and that's great. And maybe they can talk to their peers and say, hey, guys, this is not that bad. And I think that that's, that's there's going to come a point where that's going to be the case. If that's today or if that's three years from now. But you know, that is critical yeah. information to get. Mm -hmm. Who is operating in Irvington that has registered? Have they converted? Are they thinking about it? Is somebody going to say to you, you know, I have another eight months life on this one, and then I'm planning on replacing it with electric? It, we may not have really much of a problem if, in fact, people are in the process of converting, or can. But if there's if there's reasons on the other side, especially I'm thinking of these very small operations, yeah. we just need to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certainly, what um, somebody's at about a 12, 18 month basin, I think. You know, we have to give people a chance 
to they've invested in the equipment they have. And we also don't want junk equipment that um, our DPW is going to charge thirty five dollars to pick up. Prices. <laughs> I, I just have to take exception to think that the small one or two Z companies who probably aren't registering already because why would they? They're flying under the radar. Why they should hold our entire neighborhoods hostage. I'm not suggesting they hold Well, I know, but I, you, you, we keep making these statement. points that I think are, are, not, are really off the curve, off the bell curve, totally. But we, the I'm severely suggesting we get information. I do, I do not that. mischaracterize what I'm saying here. I'm suggesting we get information from the landscapers who are All right, but I don't cry with talk our registered our requirements. Who are people I, um, who aren't registered and who are you? I'm not talking about the people who are you not registered. You keep saying the small businesses. But we are requiring everybody who operates here to register, correct? Right. Yeah. But so there, if there they're are not registered, they're not very, registered I'm that are operating here. No, I am not talking, nothing I said applied to people who chose not to. We are talking about everybody supposed to register. Yeah. So let's get the information from the people who are registered. If there are people who are not registered, they need to be reminded that they have to register, and we have to, but we have to have a baseline of information. That's all I'm saying. That's fine. I just want one, one small thing related to um, landscaper preferences, just based on the research that I've done. Um, around the country, every uh, sort of landscaping industry association, every manufacturer association, everybody who ever testifies in a public hearing always says that it can't be done without gas leaf blowers. Um, and it seems like it's very hard for landscapers to buck what, you know, the entire sort of all of the governing bodies, all of the associations for their industry are saying because they have collectively invested a tremendous amount in this equipment and in that direction. Um, and I think there's just a lot of recalcitrance to sort of be seen to be the one outlier who's undermining an argument that's being made nationwide now while it's still plausible for it to be made and perhaps in a couple of years it will be so implausible that the whole industry will change. But for now, that, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to find anyone who's willing to stand up and say it, other than people who've really decided that's going to be their exclusive model, because their attitude is, why not have more options? You know, from their perspective, there's no downside to having more optionality. There's only a downside to having anyone say, hey, by the way, this argument isn't right. We actually could be doing this industry-wide. I mean, I've also, I mean, some of, that's probably some of it, but I know I've tried to get really thick leaves, even with a gas leaf blower. I've had to use a rake because even a gas leaf blower can't do it. So mm -hmm. I could understand how, uh, you know, it's, there's definitely, I think, you know, there are some more powerful still gas leaf blowers. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think to me it's a lot of it's just breaking their habits. I mean, just getting my yeah. own guys to not do it in my property. We yeah. don't want you to blow heat. We don't want you to blow grass, especially. Yeah, and I've had the same conversation. Changing that, that they're like, okay, we won't do it. And then they think they're doing it. I'm like, well, only in the walkway. And you're like, no, just don't do it. I don't care if there's grass in my walkway. It's like right. a funny, it's, like, it's a yeah. strange, like, Autopilot. but it has to look perfect. No, it doesn't. It's like, no one, it's a strange. They could make anything more? Yeah, so. Like, thank you. I want to give you time. Anyway, I think we should Reports of board, standing committees, and officers. Yes. Rusty liaison reports. Uh, nothing right now for me. Doc, I'm guessing there's a, a, a rec report? Yes. So, uh, this past Saturday, the rec department once again teamed up with Riverkeeper in support of the river sweep cleanup that was held on Saturday under the direction of Andy Hall of Eileen Fisher. The event was a great success. 26 individual vol individuals volunteered to help clean both Scenic Hudson and Matheson Park, and the park staff helped to coordinate the event. Uh, a special thanks to the Irvington Varsity Baseball team and coaches Mike Donato and Mike Tulin for spending the morning, on, I believe on Saturday, in the Irvington Woods, cleaning the, the Split Rock area for the trails. Once again, the department will sponsor the O'Hara Foundation High School Summer Basketball League starting June 16th. Residents are asked to please pick up and take their dog bags with them when in the woods and on the trails or at Wolsey Pond, and remember dogs must be on leash there. As you know, rain has played havoc on the fields and parks. Please stay off fields when they are wet and allow our staff to do their jobs. Residents are urged to respect signs indicating when the fields are closed. And just a couple of meetings. The CAB, Community Advisory Board, is meeting tomorrow, May 7th, 8 a.m. at the Senior Center. The next meeting of the Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee is Wednesday, 
May 15th, 7 p.m. at the Senior Center. The next meeting of the IFCA, the Executive Board, is Tuesday, May 21st, 8 a.m. at the Senior Center. And the Urban and Woods Committee is scheduled to meet Thursday, May 9th, 7 p.m. at the Nature Center. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Um, just uh, asking the theater about events that, you know, were coming up or had happened. Um, um, we do know that the half Halloween, um, I know Brian and I were there, I don't know if anybody else was there, but that was an amazing community event. All the bands that produce music on Halloween out on the streets came to the Irvington Town Hall Theater. It was, it was really cool. It was fun. It was, Putting your one. Yeah, it was great. It was <laughs> a really fun night. So they, they were, you know, doing it, you know, without now the charge. So all the money it. went, I don't know, ten thousand dollars anyway to the to the theater. Anyway, it was great. So, but looking forward, um, you know, of course, there's no, there's nothing in the summer in the theater uh, because it gets so hot. But we're finishing up our season. This is Greg Allen with back-to-back -back productions from Clock Towers and Broadway Training Center. This past weekend, Broadway Training Center produced a new musical from a writing team from London. They flew over to see the U.S. premiere. Now, these are kids, right, doing this mm -hmm. performance. It was a cool evening Saturday night when they did a talk back after the show. Uh, they also have one more of their commission, you know, the commissioners, the volunteers who are the commissioners, produce some events. Um, there's an event on Thursday, May 23rd, a screening of um, the World Before Your Feet. Don't know too much about that. It was a Q&A with the filmmakers. We're also finishing up, oh, this is very interesting, of course, the feasibility study um, about the, um, the, the conception of a different entrance uh, to the theater with Earl and John so we can present to the trustees later this month. So um, finding out what that feasibility study um, produced for all, I, I don't know if there's a date for that, um, Larry, about Earl and John presenting? No, the, the, well, there's two possible presentations. One is actually in front of this board on the 20th, so oh, the next okay. meeting. But then there's, and these should be brief, I mean, just mm -hmm. because you'll have the feasibility study right. in front of you. And then there's also uh, another brief presentation to the Board of Education, um, and that's tentatively July 2nd, but we're working on confirming that. All right, so it's a, it's a big project, very exciting. Um, I have from Greg Nilsson, um, they're preparing the summer equipment. They've assisted the water department with delivery of materials for the Halsey Pond project. Uh, and, oh, and the semi-annual hydrant flushing, I guess everybody knows about that. Repaired, rebuilt one catch basin on North Broadway by 120 North Broadway. I think that created a lot of problems right on the uh, Broadway, didn't it? You know, with those <laughs> yeah, okay. Painting lines and crosswalks, cleaning catch basins um, with the backhaul and filling potholes. And the water department, uh, of course they're reading meters, spring maintenance, the Halsey Pond Dam project, hydrant maintenance. Uh, fire hydrant flushing, uh, drilled holes on North Broadway near Heritage Hill to check pavement thickness for the crosswalk improvement project, that's hard to say. Jetting sewers for annual maintenance, hydrant valve failure on Harriman Road across from Victor Drive, that would be right by your house, Mark. Yes, um, we didn't have water for eight hours or so, oh, okay. but it got fixed pretty quickly. Okay. Assisted DPW with jetting a cat catch basin line near 120 uh, Broadway. Pumped out manhole by the Ardsley train station and um, it was MTA about the pipes that go under the railroad tracks. Is that all connected to the... Yes. Yes. That project? Uh, which project? I mean, it's not connected to the, 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 the walkway and all that. No. Um, or maybe they very, can. very, very indirectly. Oh, okay. But um, apparently the powerhouse building is getting flooded. Part of the project was to connect one of their roof leaders into the, the underground storm line system, and those, the line that runs under the tracks there is blocked. Oh. So we're working with Metro North to try to oh, figure it all out. That's a problem. Yeah. 
Which okay, exercising on water main valve in the East Sunnyside Hudson View Park area, preparation for the culvert, which we've talked about a lot, uh, the water main and the sewer main project. Yes, so that certainly keeps the water department busy. Um, um, I, I did, I think we talked last time about how our comprehensive plan um, won an award. Did we mention that at, at a, uh, I don't think it was mentioned in the meeting. Oh, okay. Go right ahead. Somebody should mention it. Oh, our, our comprehensive plan won an award <laughs> from the, say the name of the organization, the West Chester Westchester Municipal, Municipal Planning Federation. Planning, yeah. Right. Um, and it had to do with um, how it was organized and how much uh, public outreach there was. Um, and it was, I don't know. So, <laughs> I guess that's good. Um, <laughs> I guess that's good. We got the award. <laughs> um, but um, I, I do think I also I also found um, I was I was in Larchmont and um, at a historic event over there, the Historic Preservation and their Historical Society. And it's amazing how much people know about the Irvington um, Design Guide. That you know, that it's another one of those things that won quite a few awards. But other communities know what we've done, and um, they say, "Oh yeah, oh Irvington, oh yeah, you did the." So I mean, I think we should take a little pride in some of these. Tell us they have a problem with reef over there. Oh uh, yeah, well, they never <laughs> ask us about that. Anyway, that's the end of my report. <laughs> Okay, for the library, um, related to the wonderful presentation we had about um, recognizing the legacy of slavery here in the uh, river towns, there will be a presentation on June 18th at 7 p.m. This is obviously just one of many presentations, but this one does have a specific date and time. Uh, the Irvington Village Court, um, 54 VTL charges received, 151 disposed, and penal law 2 charges received, 4 disposed. Total money collected and remitted to the state controller, $18,196, $7,825 in surcharges, $389 in civil fees for a total of $26,410. For the um, fire department, they had 15 calls this month, and this is as of the April 25th meeting, 15 calls this month and 96 calls years to date. They um, recognized that they were the swearing in of their uh, own officers. And went through this is again we don't usually get just the minutes from their their meetings but it was interesting to look at how the rigs are assigned very specifically and the just the range of departmental responsibilities that are under somebody's attention from apparatus maintenance to calendars and mailings to trainings equipment facility gas detector bump test fire prevention monthly maintenance and so on and so on there's a lot um, there's a paving project for the Field Point Complex. Emergency vehicles will be able to access roadways. Date to begin determined. Irvington Boat Club is anticipating construction to begin shortly and to be completed by November. The boat to be docked in Tarrytown, and they will let us know when that happens. Um, they're working with the police department to schedule a walkthrough of a critical response situation. Um, and training in April included a burn building with Ardsley and rope training with MPI. Um, events and special details that are coming up. There will be an annual dinner, and the Tarrytown Fire Department will cover Irvington when we have our annual dinner, so I guess there's uh, mutual coverage there. Girl Scouts are going to visit on May 4th at 9.30, and there will be Touch a Truck Day on Tuesday, May 14th at 4, rain day being Thursday the 6th. Okay, that's it for me. Those are report. Um, well, I was going to announce the uh, Westchester Municipal Planning <laughs> Federation Award. <laughs> I'll pass on that. Somebody. <laughs> no, uh, j just a quick thing. We're, tomorrow we have a very uh, short training session with um, a representative from Sustainable Westchester to walk us through the um, the online recycling and sanitation calendar function that we're going to have. So basically, someone could go in. Uh, punch in their address and find out a, and get a personalized calendar as opposed to a conglomerate of a calendar. Uh, it also will have uh, an, an app available to link to it for those that need to have reminders about when to put their garbage out and all the other things. Uh, they can also look up uh, various types of items that they're disposing and find out how to dispose them if there's instructions on that. 
Uh, Which so does change periodically. Yeah, it'll yeah. be maintained and updated. We're going we're to learn about how to yeah, do yeah. that. And so <laughs> that's tomorrow. When, so you'll have some Who goes uh, sustainable Westchester people here. Tomorrow there's a train a person, yeah, Miha. So not the, but they're not someone you can talk to about the uh, char EV charging station no. project. I don't think Miha's involved in that. Anything else? Go clear Treasurer's report. Okay. Uh, the end of, of our fiscal year is quickly approaching, March 31st. We have our audit dates already. It'll be early, uh, early July. And we'll start to work with our department heads to get submissions for the capital budget. Capital budget. Go report. Public comment. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of follow-up comments on the GL, the gas leak floors, but I'm not going to say it because I respect that you've tabled it and I understand. Um, but it, just one particular point, though, that dovetails with the whole storm drain and everything and also about the power piece, um, these things all work together. So um, degradation, degradation of the soil is perhaps, even though the emissions and the noise and everything is the big public nuisance, the probably bigger problem is the degradation of soil. And that UN report that Lisa mentioned, um, you know, just supports a lot of that. And so as the Northeast continues to get more rain, and that is what we're supposed to be in for. This is our new norm. And so um, when we don't use leaf blowers to, to strip the top of the soil, because there's no, even the fertilizers and everything else, there's no way to replace what nature does when leaves are left in place and, um, you know, plant life is allowed to absorb moisture. We get, we're going to, we get more rain already with the way the climate has changed. And then the storm drains are, you know, have more and more pressure on them. And our blow, blowing the tops of things creates further, uh, further um, erosion. And then, um, you know, taxes our systems. So I guess what I would say is the topic of electric leaf blowers perhaps not being as strong as gas leaf blowers is sort of a good thing. We should not be blowing strong, powerful air that strips our topsoil. And um, so it just the, I leave you with that thought. There, you know, a lot, a lot more to think about around this. But that might be our our biggest way to really tackle this. It's important for our future, so that we don't all wash into the Hudson. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding on that. But anyway, um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you have there? Um, I mean, there's. Schedule. We have some work sessions and upcoming meetings, but besides that, uh, nothing. Can happen. I will make a motion to adjourn to executive session regarding a volunteer appointment. Uh, if I get a second. Okay. All in favor. Aye.